If there ever was a time for you to come to the text as if you are hearing it for the first time, this is it. The words I'm about to read are so familiar that they have been literally carved in stone, not only in public squares and courthouses and storefronts and front yards, they have been chiseled into us as well. Through thousands of years, we have been conditioned to see these verses as the rules that must be obeyed. And as soon as we hear those first words, our minds are already measuring how well we've done or not done each one. We're already comparing ourselves to others as well. Well, I haven't lied in six months, or I always honor my father and mother, or at least I haven't murdered anyone. And in the process, we miss the point entirely. Focus not on the community of faith of which we are a part, but on ourselves and on our own self-righteousness. As Jesse described at the beginning of our service, 500 years ago, the very same thing happened when Martin Luther placed those famous statements on the door in Wittenberg, Germany. Originally, in response to the self-righteousness of the Roman Catholic Church, the reformers themselves quickly fell prey to their own self-righteousness, their own new rules of being reformed. I guess they forgot the second half of that motto, that famous motto that begins with being reformed. The part they forgot is always reforming. In our text, God was calling a people together to live in community with one another. And I believe God is still calling a people to live in community with one another. Depending upon how you count, the first four commandments are about our relationship with God. The next six are about our relationships with each other. Did you get that? Four for God, six about us. Do you think there's a message here? I do. We are a part of an amazing denomination, and anyone who studies the Book of Order, especially the new one, will discover that relationship trumps rules every time, especially now. The more you read and the more you understand that it is hard work to be a Presbyterian. Written into the very DNA of our denomination is the awareness that we are all different. As Presbyterians, we do not only get to say what we believe, we also live those beliefs in a community of other believers who may not believe exactly the same as we do. It's all about living those beliefs while showing compassion for others. It's about living those beliefs within the tension between world and church. In short, it is about always reforming. So this morning I'm asking you to put aside everything that you have ever heard or known about these verses. What we need today is the assurance of God's presence who has promised never to forsake us. What we need today, especially today, when so many are hurting and doing without, even right here, what we need is the knowledge that God has not given up on us. I want you to give yourselves permission to imagine that our denomination and these verses are inviting all of us as individuals and as a church to move from a relationship with rules to live in a new relationship with God, with each other, and within ourselves. Listen. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make 
for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day it is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your town. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts meet with the intention of your Holy Spirit for wholeness, for healing, and for hope. Amen. So let's take a quick look at this relationship that we have with God. How many of you think that the God of the Old Testament is harsh, judgmental, and wrathful? Raise your hands. How many of you think that the God of the New Testament is gracious and loving and forgiving? It's usually about the way that voting goes. That's how we generally feel. Sodom and Gomorrah and Joshua's battles to win the promised land are but two of the many examples of God's Old Testament wrath. We can even see a more immediate example in the words just preceding our text this morning where God really got mad. We want to think of God based upon our experience, and our experience for the most part in the Old Testament has been to see a God of anger and wrath and judgment. And likewise, in the New Testament, we see Jesus as the loving and caring and forgiving the new side of God. But I believe that if we look a little bit more carefully, we can see in the New Testament examples of Jesus like in our New Testament text this morning that are not a really nice and forgiving picture. And by the same token, we can see images of God in the Old Testament. In Hosea, for instance, where God pleads over and over again and promises never to forsake God's people. And of course, there are words that come to mind for all of us, especially this week, after the funerals we've had, where we've said together the words, those touching words of the 23rd Psalm. And then there's God who in Isaiah says, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. But 
But did you know that right here at Sinai, we witness the loving character of God? Yes, believe it or not, right here, before we get to the angry God of the mountain, before we see the fury of a God who wants to wipe the Hebrews off the face of the earth, before Moses has to intervene on their behalf to keep them from divine slaughter, right here is where God establishes a new relationship. No longer would they worship God by hearsay. No longer would they rely on what others have said before about this God. Now, God is saying, I want them to know what I have done for them. But even before this plain truth, before any of these words, God reminds them that it is God who has made the first move. God acts first. God commits first. Starting here, we have a picture of God who is building the foundation for the relationship, not only for Israel, but for us. God is showing us how to live in relationship with God and with one another and within ourselves. God puts a personal face on it. God points to the picture gallery and says, look closely. These are all my children, the widow, the orphan in your midst, the stranger looking for food, even the Wall Street banker. And by these labels and many others, you and I do the opposite. We dehumanize each other with those labels. We slap them on each other. Labels like fundamentalist, conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican, and use them as if they were curse words. We label everyone that looks Middle Eastern as a terrorist. A Sunday school teacher was working with 14-year-olds one Sunday morning. They were in a prayer circle, and knowing that some of the kids knew people who had been deployed to Iraq, she asked them, what do we know about Iraq? And one of the 14-year-olds said, let's kill them. Let's just kill them all. And then he said, wait, they have children too, don't they? Yes, they do. This 14-year-old gets it. We cannot continue to, de to dehumanize each other. The labels that we use are fraught with all kinds of baggage, white, black, gay, straight, installed pastor, interim pastor, <laughs> elder, church member, visitor, old person, child, Wall Street executive, enemy, friend. It is so subtle. But if you really pay attention, you can hear and even feel the stereotyping and prejudice leaking out and getting all over everything. We are in a new relationship with God. Therefore, we can no longer see these Ten Commandments as rules that we obey in order to win God's favor. Since they are grounded in the action of a living God who acts on our behalf before we can ever call God's name, then we are left with no other response except endless gratitude. These commandments are no longer a means to getting our ticket punched for our seats in the kingdom. These words were never intended to be ways that we could attain our fitness before God, for God has already deemed us fit for the kingdom before we ever knew God. Our response can only then be a life of thanksgiving and praise. If you really listen carefully, even in this text from the fearful God of the mountain in the Old Testament, you can hear God saying, you are a beautiful and precious child of God. And there is nothing that you have ever done and nothing you can ever do to make me stop loving you. No, 
Go live your life as if you believe it's true. You are a precious child of God, not because of what you have done or will ever do, but because God said so. Before you were ever a gleam in anyone's eye, God chose you before you were born. Why don't I see you smiling? We're in a new relationship with God, and we're in a new relationship with each other. And if that's true, then we can dispense with the boxes that we put ourselves in to keep us safe. We can 86 the labels and the stereotypes that we use to keep us at arm's length from each other. Wasn't it Jesus who said, I have come to fulfill all the law and the prophets? He said, love God and love one another. And he lived a life among us that demonstrated that and demonstrated to what extent we are to love each other. In the short time that I have been here with you, I have seen beautiful expressions of God's love in and among you here, just as recently as last night. And this week embodied in the lives of Gwen Nash and Mary Margaret Federici, who we buried this week. I've also been witness to comments from others, and even to me, that are more appropriate on a battlefield than they are in a church. We seem to have accepted a level of incivility here that is driving people away. It is a level of discourse that demeans and that ridicules and that makes you feel less than. It just makes me wonder what it would look like around here if we started to see each other through God's eyes. Through the eyes of love. How would that change the way we talk to and listen to each other? We are in a new relationship with God and with each other. And you and I are in a new relationship within ourselves. What do you see when you look in the mirror? Who do you see? I mean really see. How old is that person that you see in the mirror? Are they newborn? Are they two? Or four? Or 10? Or 30? Or 89? For most of my life, I never really saw who was looking back at me in the mirror. And when I did, I hated my reflection. I hated it because I internalized our family motto. Can I tell you what our family motto was? The beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> Needless to say, it did not improve. Until one day, a good friend of mine taught me how to see, to see deeply, to stop, to breathe, and to wait until, in my case, a scared little five-year-old boy found the courage to come out of hiding and reveal himself. For the first time in his life, he knew it was safe to do so. He knew that his being acceptable was not contingent upon rules or unrealistic demands that he could never achieve in 10,000 lifetimes. He is still learning that every day.
maybe our job is to see God with those same eyes. To see each other with those same eyes. To see the one within ourselves, even in the mirror, if we're lucky, who loves us completely and totally and without reservation. What might it be like to live in such a new relationship? Let us stand and affirm our faith as we join together in our affirmation of faith found printed in your bulletin. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord.